Let's go ahead and uh, open with a word of prayer. I invite you all to bow your heads with me as we just have a short prayer asking the Lord for his Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Loving Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us even now, that your Holy Spirit will continue to preside over the meeting, and that our hearts might be warmed with the testimonies of your grace and goodness. And now, Lord, instruct us in the way in which we should go. Help us to understand the importance of this great day of atonement as we look at this study this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, again, forgive me for uh, coughing in your ear. We're going to uh, transition now into our next feast, right? So we've been going over uh, the sanctuary for the last year or so. We've been studying through the feast for the last number of months. And um, we finished off with the, the Feast of Trumpets, looking at the Feast of Trumpets in its uh, actual literal application, as well as what it pointed forward to in a spiritual sense um, at the end of the world, where, where it was fulfilled, I should say. And so we're going to do the same thing with the Day of Atonement. But because the Day of Atonement is, is all of the feasts are important, but the Day of Atonement carries with it a lot of weight. So we want to kind of break this up into a few different parts. So I want to start with you in the book of Joel, chapter two. Joel, the second chapter. All right, we're looking in Joel, the second chapter. And um, I'm going to start in verse 12. So as we're transitioning from the Feast of Trumpets into the Day of Atonement, and how they are intricately, con intricately connected. Remember that the uh, Feast of Trumpets was 10 days before the Day of Atonement. It was actually the Feast of Trumpets is what prepared the people for the Day of Atonement. So uh, let's look at this work of preparation that the Feast of Trumpets uh, uh, prepared the people for, okay? Uh, this work of preparation. So let's go to uh, Joel, excuse me, Joel chapter two, and we're gonna pick it up in verse 12. And I'm going to read down to verse 17. Now, uh, we're looking specifically at Joel 2, 12 through 17, just gathering the principles of what happens in the calling of this great assembly with the trumpet. All right. So it says, therefore, also, therefore, also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and uh, leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Therefore should they say, wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? So you'll notice here that along with the blowing of the trumpet in Zion in verse 15 comes this uh, fast, this sanctified fast, this solemn assembly, the gathering of the people, the sanctifying of the congregation, the assembling of all the people, old and young. And so this uh, 10 days of preparation uh, when it comes to the Feast of Trumpets, this 10 days of preparation for the Day of Atonement. Uh, in the uh, Hebrew language, in the Jewish economy, it is called, in, as it is interpreted, right? I'm not gonna give the, the Hebrew name, but it's called the 10 days of awe, A-W-E. So uh, when the uh, first day of the seventh month came, you have this 10 days of preparation for the 10th day of the seventh month, which is the Day of Atonement. And these 10 days of preparation were called the days of awe or the days of repentance, even. And these were ones of, you know, personal spiritual reflection, repentance, recommitment, heart searching. This is what the children of Israel were doing on these 10 days of the blowing of the trumpet. And the trumpet was a fitting instrument to call the people to this work of preparation. You know, it's sound, if you think of it in a literal sense, its sound can be heard all around the camp. Nobody would miss it. Uh, if people were spiritually slumbering, it would arouse them to wake out of their spiritual lethargy. So this uh, 
10 days of all, these 10 days of preparation for the actual Day of Atonement was a time of preparation of heart and life to meet the Lord. Now, turn to Leviticus 23, because uh, we want to talk about what, incur what occurred uh, during these 10 days of the Feast of Trumpets as we're moving into the Day of Atonement. So Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, and we're going to start in verse 23. Leviticus 23, beginning with verse 23. I'm going to read verse 23 and 24, and then jump down into verse 27. So again, we're going from the Feast of Trumpets into the Day of Atonement. Uh, the 10 days of awe, 10 days of repentance, 10 days of preparation during the Feast of Trumpets prepares us for the Day of Atonement. So it says in Leviticus 23, verse 23 and 24, it says, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and a holy convocation. All right, now jump into verse 27. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So here we have on the 10th day of the seventh month, this day of atonement, and this day of atonement was a holy, convoca a holy convocation and during which the people were to afflict their souls. Now, the day of atonement, I'm going to read something to you uh, that's, that's very powerful, I believe. Uh, you know, we have this day of atonement, which in reality in the Jewish economy was a day of judgment, and it was believed that the judgment of the world would be sealed for the coming year. So on the day of atonement, uh, this was the sealing of the judgment uh, for the people. And I'm gonna read, from, read to you from the Jewish Encyclopedia on the day of atonement. This is the Jewish Encyclopedia. This is volume two, page 285. This is the article uh, atonement or the day of atonement. It says, God seated on his throne to judge the world at the same time, judge, pleader, expert, and witness openeth the book of records. It is read, every man's signature being found therein. The great trumpet is sounded, a still small voice is heard. The angels shudder, saying, this is the day of judgment, for his very ministers are not pure before God. As a shepherd mustereth his flock, causeth them to pass under his rod, so doth God cause every living soul to pass before him to fix the limit of every creature's life and to foreordain its destiny. On the day of atonement, it is sealed who shall live and who are to die. All right. So in the Jewish uh, encyclopedia, the, uh, the Jews understood the day of atonement, the actual day of atonement, the literal day of atonement that they have once every year was a day of judgment. So during Rosh Hashanah, when you have the trumpet blast, it would or the you know the, the feast of trumpets, it would signal that this day of judgment was coming and that the people needed to prepare. And those who neglected to prepare for this day of judgment uh, would jeopardize their life. All right. So uh, literally, the Day of Atonement in the Hebrew economy, it was understood that this was a day of judgment. This is not just, you know, the Day of Atonement spiritually applied to the judgment uh, now. Uh, no, the Day of Atonement was a day of judgment from the beginning of its inception. Now, staying in the book of Leviticus, I want to turn over to chapter 16 and when we're talking about this day of atonement, there are five things that are associated with the sanctuary needing atonement, all right? There are five things that needed atonement during this day. So we're gonna find these out together. So look, we're going to Leviticus chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 33. And you have these five things that needed atonement on the day of atonement, all right? So Leviticus 16, verse 30. All right, it says, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. So, okay, we have these five things. We have the people, you know, taking this verse and just going 
do it backwards. You have the people, you have the priests, you have the altar. Now this altar was the altar of incense that was in the sanctuary itself. Then you have the atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, which you can say is the entire sanctuary, or you can apply that specifically to the uh, first department. And then you have the atonement for the holy sanctuary, which is applicable to the second apartment. So you have the sanctuary as a whole, first and second apartment that needs atonement. We have the altar of incense specifically that needs atonement. And we have the priests and the people that needed atonement. Now, there are two things that made atonement necessary in this chapter. So we want to stay in chapter 16, and we're going to read verse, let's start in verse 16. So we're going to look in Leviticus 16 and verse 16, then I'm going to jump down to verse 19, and then finally in verse 34. And we're going to notice the two things that made atonement necessary. So we have five things that needed atonement, the holy place, most holy place, the altar of incense, the people and the priests needed atonement. And there are two things that made atonement necessary. All right. So look at Leviticus 16, verse 16. The Bible says, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 19. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And then in verse 34, it says, and this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So oftentimes when people read these verses, we kind of summarize uh, just in one word the reason uh, that, or I should say, we summarize in one word that which made atonement necessary. We call it sin. But in Leviticus 16, it's describing the transgressions of the people, their sins, transgression of the law, but then we also have their uncleanness. And we've talked about in our study of the sanctuary before that there were rich, there was ritual uncleanness as well that needed to be uh, cleansed from the people. <clears throat> so the uncleanness that we're talking about here, uh, which was ritual impurities of the people, along with their transgressions, their sins, the breaking of the law, this is this required uh, that the sanctuary needed to be cleansed. So during the year, you know, the people would confess their sins, their sins would be transferred to the sanctuary, thus defiling the sanctuary. But on the day of atonement, the record of their sins was removed. Now, there's two parts to the Day of Atonement, and we're going to look at this further in upcoming lessons, but there's two things on the Day of Atonement. There's forgiveness on the Day of Atonement, as well as the cleansing from sin. And we know that in 1 John chapter 1, verse uh, 9, the Bible tells us that God or Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a two-step process. Forgiveness and cleansing are two separate things. They are not the same. Forgiveness precedes the cleansing. And so on the Day of Atonement, there was forgiveness that was still taking place. They still had their daily sacrifices that were uh, for the purpose of forgiving sin. But then there was also the final atonement that was made, which cleansed the sin from the sanctuary. So when the sinner would confess their uh, sins on the head of the lamb during the, the daily ritual, uh, this would remove their sins from them. This would be... Uh, offering them pardon and forgiveness. You can see that in Leviticus chapter four, verse 26, but the cleansing part, that didn't occur until the final steps on the day of atonement, all right? So we have 10 days of preparation beginning with the Feast of Trumpets. During that 10 days of preparation, it was a heart searching, repentance, confession. Uh, people got their life together. Uh, they were preparing for the 10th day of the seventh month, the seventh month, excuse me, which is the day of atonement because that day was the day of judgment. That day would forever fix the people's destiny. All right. And um, on the day of atonement, there was forgiveness as well as cleansing, forgiveness through the daily sacrifice. And then of course, that yearly service which was the actual atonement that would cleanse and remove the sins from the people. And that, that which needed atonement was the sanctuary itself, the uh, first and second apartment or holy and most holy place, 
You have the altar of incense that also needed atonement, and then the priest and the people needed atonement. And sin is the overarching umbrella term, but we're talking specifically about transgression or breaking the law. That needed to be cleansed, as well as the ritual uncleanness of the people if they had uh, brought that upon themselves. And this was taken care of in the Day of Atonement. Now, flip over to Leviticus chapter 4. Let's flip over to Leviticus, the fourth chapter. And I want to pick up in verse 13. So Leviticus chapter 4, we're going to look in verse 13. And um, we're going to talk about how these sins were brought into the sanctuary. All right, so we're going to look at two, two scriptures in Leviticus. First, we're going to Leviticus 4, verse 13 um, through 18. So we'll read verse 13 through 18. So Leviticus chapter 4, 13 through 18. Then we'll turn to Leviticus 10. But there's two different ways that the sins of the people were brought into the sanctuary. All right, now this needs to be marked in your mind or in your notes or um, as you're understanding or learning about this experience. So Leviticus chapter 4, verse 13 says, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against, when the sin, excuse me, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the people, for the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord, and the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood of the tap into the, uh, excuse me, to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil, that's the veil that separates the holy from the most holy place, and he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, this altar of incense. He will put some blood on the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering in the courtyard, which is at the door of the temple of the congregation. So the first way that the sins of people were brought into the sanctuary is through the ministration of the blood. The priest would take that blood. Uh, of course, the person would confess their sins upon the animal. Uh, the animal will be killed, the blood will be taken, and it will be sprinkled in, in the sanctuary by the priest and then put on the horns of the altar. Remember, the altar needed atonement, and it's because the sin, blood was on the horns of the altar, a record of sins was made there. And so throughout the year, this was done, and the blood was sprinkled, the blood was put on the horns of the altar, and this was a record, a writing down, if you will, of the sins of the people as they confess them. And then there's a second way that uh, sin was brought in the sanctuary. So if you flip over to Leviticus chapter 10, flip over there, Leviticus chapter 10, we're gonna look in verse 16. Leviticus chapter 10, we're going to verse 16, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'll read to verse 18. In Leviticus 10, verse 16, it says, And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, seeing it is most holy? And God hath given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make an atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. So there are two ways that sins were brought into the sanctuary. It was either by the blood or it was by the flesh that was eaten by the priest. The, uh, the priest would take that, a piece of that flesh. Uh, of course, you know, it was not raw, right? It was, it was roasted, uh, burnt on the altar. They would take that flesh, they would eat it. And then when they went into the sanctuary, they would be carrying the sins of the people. So the priest became the sin bearer of the people and then brought that in the sanctuary to record a record of sins, all right? So these are the two ways that uh, sin was brought into the sanctuary. Now, in Leviticus chapter four, <clears throat> in Leviticus chapter four, um, let's go back there, Leviticus the fourth chapter, 
I want to look at verse six and seven. So this, this study that we're doing now is preparatory for that which is to come. So we're just laying the groundwork, um, putting some uh, building blocks in place, pegs and pins, as I like to say. So we're looking in Leviticus chapter four, verse six and verse seven. And let's talk about where the, the, the sin laden blood needed to be sprinkled. All right, we kind of read this already, but we're gonna read it again. So Leviticus, the fourth chapter, verse six and seven, and then I'll jump down to uh, verse 25. So it says, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the, al of the, of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, verse 25. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. So again, the blood was brought in, sprinkled seven times before the veil and put on the horns of the altar. And you can, you can just write down Leviticus chapter five, verse nine. That's just another text that shows this point here. So when we're talking about the blood, the blood is sprinkled. Um, you know, the blood, the blood is sprinkled in the direction going towards the ark, right? So we're having, uh, if, if I wish I should put a picture of the sanctuary up, but you kind of have seen it drawn out many times as the people are entering in, their back is to the sun. So they're entering in on the east. And then when they would go in, the priest will go into the, the holy place. You would have on the north side, which would be your the right side as you're entering in the sanctuary, would be the uh, uh, the table of showbread. And on the left, which would be the south side of the sanctuary, you would have the seven branch candlestick. And then going forward, continuing as you're traveling uh, west, right into the sanctuary with your back towards the sun, you would meet the uh, altar of incense and then you would have the veil and you would come into the most holy place and you would have the Ark of the Covenant. So the, the blood is sprinkled in the direction that's going towards the Ark of the Covenant on the altar of burnt offering, uh, before the altar of incense, upon its horns, then upon the veil that separated the holy from the most holy place, they would sprinkle the blood towards that direction. All right. So, you know, these are the very locations that needed to be cleansed on the Day of Atonement by the blood that contained no sin um, that would bring atonement. And so we'll we'll talk about that. So there's blood that carries a record of sins and it and then there's blood that has no sin that would bring atonement and cleanse the sanctuary. Um, but as we were talking about the direction, and this is an important point, uh, the direction of the cleansing would begin in the most holy place and work its way outward to the court. In this way, you know, the sins were removed from the sanctuary. So they would start within and they would work their way out. Still, the direction of the sprinkling of the blood was always the same. Now, now that we've put those pegs and pins in place, let's end the study with this last point, okay? There's another way that sin could defile the sanctuary, okay? We talked about the way that sin would defile the sanctuary by the confession of the sins of the people upon the, the sacrifice and then the carrying in of the flesh uh, uh, or the eating of the flesh or the carrying in and sprinkling of the blood. That's how the sins would get into the sanctuary. But there's another way that sin actually defiled the sanctuary if a person did not confess their sins and transfer it into the sanctuary through the blood. So the actions of, there are certain actions that people could do that would defile the sanctuary, but that does not necessarily mean that their sins were transferred to the sanctuary. So I wanna read some, uh, just three, three texts with you and then uh, read a quote or two in closing. So the first one we're gonna look, in, uh, look at is Leviticus chapter 20, verse Three. And this is going to teach us a, an important principle. So looking at Leviticus 20, verse 3, it says, And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. So in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 3, one way that the sanctuary was defiled was by the sacrifice 
of the children, giving their children to Molech. This was a sin that uh, could not be effaced. This was a sin that cannot be forgiven. This was a sin that immediately caused the people to be cut off from God. Uh, in the book of Numbers chapter 19, look at Numbers the 19th chapter. Numbers 19, and let's start in verse 13, and then we'll read verse 20. So Numbers 19, verse 13 and 20. The Bible says, whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself. Remember, we had studies uh, a few months ago that talked about the ritual defilement of, of a dead body, but there was a cleansing ritual for that. Well, here it says, whoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. And then verse 20, it says, but the man that is unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. So notice in Numbers 19, verse 13 and 20, people who were defiled, ritually defiled by the dead body of a man or a woman or just a person in general, um, if they did not go through the cleansing ritual, the Bible says they defiled the sanctuary and because they were unclean, they would be cut off from Israel and their uncleanness would yet be upon them. In other words, just like the sacrificing of children to Moloch, Molech defiled the sanctuary and there was no remedy and the people were cut off, in this same manner, a person who did not go through the cleansing ritual after being uh, defiled by a dead body was also defiling the sanctuary and they would be cut off and there would be no way to cleanse them from their sin. The last one we can see is found in Ezekiel 23. And this there's other texts, but it, you'll get the point. So Ezekiel 23, let's look at verse 36 through 39. Ezekiel 23, verse 36 to 39. And then we'll talk about why we're bringing this point out here. So Ezekiel 23, verse 36 to 39. It says, the Lord said moreover unto me, son of man, wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholaba? Yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands and with their idols they have committed adultery and they have caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Moreover this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then that they came the same day to my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus they have done in the midst of mine house. So the Bible again is describing sins that would defile the sanctuary. So the sanctuary could be defiled always by sin, but by sin in two ways. The first way would be the way that Christ set up, excuse me, <clears throat> the way that Christ set up through the sacrificial system to bring atonement. The sinner would confess his sins. They would transfer to that lamb or that animal in general then they would be killed, their blood would be taken into the sanctuary, or their flesh would be eaten by the priests and brought into the sanctuary, and thus their sins were transferred from them to the sanctuary uh, to be forgiven, and the sanctuary would be defiled by it and needed to be cleansed on the Day of Atonement. Then there's the second way that sin can get could defile the sanctuary, but that Second way had nothing to do with forgiveness. It had nothing to do with sacrifice. It had nothing to do with people confessing their sins. These were sins that, yes, defiled the sanctuary, but these were sins that were unpardonable. And so I want to read something to you. This is a, there's a book called Alter, Alter Call. It's a book on the sanctuary by Roy, Roy Gain. Uh, and this is page 212. It's a pretty powerful, uh, powerful paragraph. So speaking of these sins that, you know, defile the sanctuary, but don't enter the sanctuary through the regular lines or the regular means of forgiveness, it said these sins short-circuited the sacrificial process that was the legitimate way to bring sins to the Lord. 
God was pleased when a repentant person brought his or her sins to him so that he could forgive and cleanse that individual through sacrifice. But when a person threw a sin at God so that its defilement invaded his sanctuary in an illegitimate way, God was not pleased. An Israelite who defiled the sanctuary illegitimately rather than through sacrifice was condemned by God and there was no animal sacrifice that could remove this condemnation. So when we're thinking of the Old Testament economy, right, the sanctuary uh, in the Hebrew economy, the unpardonable sin applied then as well, just as surely as it does in the Christian dispensation. So in the Old Testament, there was what was considered an unpardonable sin, just like there is in the New Testament. You know, Jesus speaks about this in Matthew chapter 12, about the sin against the Holy Spirit that could not be forgiven or would not be forgiven men. And uh, there are two states, statements and in inspiration that I'll just read quickly, very short statements that uh, make it clear what the unpardonable sin is in the New Testament. And therefore, we can take that principle and apply it even in the old. So that which is taking place today that Jesus is referring to an unpardonable sin is not anything new. It was also found in the Old Testament sanctuary system as well. So in Desire of Ages, page 324, this is paragraph two, it says, there are none so hardened as those who have slighted the invitation of mercy and done despite the spirit of grace. The most common manifestation of the sin against the Holy Spirit is in persistently slighting heaven's invitation to repent. Every step in the rejection of, excuse me, every step in the rejection of Christ is a step towards the rejection of salvation and toward the sin against the Holy Spirit. So the language here, she's identifying specifically the most common manifestation of the sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, so therefore it mentions, it's therefore uh, representing that there are other ways uh, to sin against the Holy Spirit as well. But the most common is the persistent sliding of heaven's invitation to repent. And uh, this next statement makes that very clear as well. This is Review and Herald. June 29th, 1897, this is paragraph nine. It says, no one need look upon the sin against the Holy Ghost as something mysterious and indefinable. The sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of persistent refusal to respond to the invitation to repent. And so friends, as we're looking at this day of atonement and we're looking at uh, the preparation of the day of atonement, how the day of atonement was the great judgment day, um, how we were, or the children of Israel were to prepare their hearts, prepare themselves for this great day of atonement, recognizing that the, uh, the outcome of the day of atonement sealed the judgment, sealed the destiny, sealed the fate of the people for the next year. Um, and we look and see that sins confessed can be brought into the sanctuary for cleansing and sins that are considered, um, you know, ineffaceable, unpardonable, also defiled the sanctuary, but the people would have to bear those sins. We're talking about the unpardonable sin. Here we are, uh, and we're going to see that we are living in this great day of atonement, and each and every time we uh, call upon the Lamb of God to take away our sins, we confess our sins upon him. We allow him to take our sins um, those sins are transferred to the sanctuary and they go beforehand into judgment to be blotted out. But then there are those sins against the Holy Ghost that will put us in a position where we cannot find forgiveness. And the most common form is the persistent refusal of heaven's invitation to repent. We're doing things God is bringing to us that we need to repent. He's showing us that we're doing wrong and we keep pushing it off, keep pushing them away, keep pushing away, keep, keep refusing repentance. Eventually that voice goes, uh, goes silent. We grieve the spirit of God and there's nothing that can be done. It happened in the Old Testament. It also is applicable in the New Testament. So as we go to our season of prayer, our time of prayer together in our groups, let us remember that we are living in very solemn times. We are living in judgment time, a time where yes, we can find forgiveness and cleansing from our sins, but if we persistently refuse heaven's invitation to repent, 
We will defile the sanctuary and the sanctuary will need to be cleansed, but we will be the ones that will bear our sin. With these thoughts in mind, let's go into our breakout rooms, our groups. <clears throat> and remember, as we uh, go into our groups this evening, um, when you are finished praying, you can just silently log off. The only one that needs to remain on is the host until everyone is finished. Um, but we won't come back for a closing prayer necessarily. You go ahead and close prayer in your groups.